Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, today, my topic uh, is overseas Chinese, and I emphasize overseas Chinese and the Jewish diaspora. This uh, stems from a uh, current research myself and several of my colleagues are doing. Okay, and uh, so we've been we started off as research looking at family family businesses, and we extended that to cultural differences itself. Okay, uh, it's actually coincidental and also very fortuitous that I'm doing this presentation here in Shanghai. Why? I'll tell you why. Shanghai was one of the most friendly cities towards the Jewish people. The first wave of Jewish people came. These are Sephardic Jews. They came to this uh, city, lovely city, by Baghdad, then India, and over here. And many of them actually did extremely well financially. And some of them you might remember their names. I show you three specific buildings here. The top building is the site of the current Shanghai Exhibition Center. This is built on the Garden of Hardong, and some of you older Shanghainese like myself would remember Hardong Huayuan. Okay, the second one on your very, uh, I guess on your right and my left, that is the Peace Hotel. It started off as the Sasong Hotel. And the one on your right is actually the Kadori, or the Peninsula Hotel. So these are all the first wave Jewish people, and they've done extremely well here in Shanghai. The second wave of Jewish people came. These are the Russian Jews. They came after 1917 of the Bolshevik Russian Revolution itself. And the third wave was the German Jews. As a result of the Nazi Holocaust, and it was estimated between the year uh, 1933 and 1943, over 30,000 Jewish people actually came to Shanghai itself. Now, also, I should remind everyone in this room: Shanghai was the only place that allowed these people to enter without a visa. So this is haven to them, uh, to them at the time. A second reason, to fortuitous reason, that I'm actually an American-born Shanghainese. Okay, so、uh, this is another thing, and I thought I'd show you some photographs of myself. I was actually born in the United States when my father went to university,、uh, University of Michigan. Okay, and uh, studied uh, political science and. Uh, my father and my mother came back together with myself and my sister in 1946. So the picture on your、uh, right is actually taken a family photo of myself, my father, my sister, and my two older brothers. The picture on the left was taken probably in 1948, and we were sitting in the front steps of our grandfather's garden, which is in the French Concession. By the way, this building still exists, and I actually visited the building several years back. And they challenged me, say, "Why are you here?" I told them this was our old house, and I actually gave a tour to the guards that were guarding the place. And and today is actually a、uh, administration building for one of the schools,、uh, very very near the Hardom、uh, Garden itself. Okay, so this is in the French Concession itself. So this is the second reason. This is very, very appropriate because I am an American-born Shanghainese, I should say. The third thing about Shanghai and the Jewish people is this: Shanghainese are known to be very good business people, especially those that immigrated from the Ningbo or Zhejiang province itself, which my parents were also originally from there. Okay, or their heritage, and because Shanghainese are good business people. In a very complimentary way, Shanghainese、uh, consider the Chinese Jews. Okay, so this is、uh, another interesting coincidence. Another thing is that I have often been asked by my friends, my Western friends, ask me, Roger, how can you tell the difference between 
a Japanese, Chinese, and a Korean. And my Chinese friends tell me, Roger, how can you tell the difference between a Jewish person and other Westerners? So I thought I'd give you a little bit of a, a photograph of what some of these people look like, okay? Well, this one is probably everyone recognized. This is Jewish people. By the way they dress, their hairdo, these are Orthodox Jews, okay? Let's look at this one. Now, you probably recognize many of these. You see Kissinger, right? You see Charlie Chaplin. You see Bernie Sanders up there, by the way. Is he Jewish or not Jewish? And there is Mark Zuckerberg. By the way, he's only 31 years old. He's one of the co-founders of uh, Facebook. Today, he's estimated to worth 48 billion U.S. dollars, 12 times more rich than Donald Trump. <laughs> By the way, his wife is Chinese, okay? <laughs> so how many of those are actually Jewish people? Actually, all of them, right? So can you really tell? Not easy. Now, I'll show you another photograph. Okay, which one's Japanese, which one's Chinese, which is Korean? <laughs> Korean, Chinese, Japanese? Well, I had a difficult time, okay? So anyway, anyway, I mentioned that uh, there are 40 million overseas Chinese. About 30 million of those actually live in South China, uh, Southeast Asia countries itself. And about, there are about 4.4 million ethnic Chinese in the United States, making up about 1.3% uh, of the population. There are 14 million Jewish people globally. 40% actually live in the United States. Okay, this has some implication later on and they constitute about 2.3% of the total population itself. Okay, this again, I'll talk about some of the values that we, uh, I should actually switch this back a little bit, okay? And I'll uh, discuss that a little bit more. But, so let me just spend a little bit more time on what are some of the similarities between overseas Chinese and uh, Jewish people. First, we are self-reliant. We have to depend on ourselves when we're overseas. We cannot depend on other people. So most of us, when we go overseas, they cannot find jobs, they create their own jobs. Many of them form small businesses, and eventually they, these small businesses turn into family businesses. Of course, the Chinese are very famous for the Chinese restaurants, hand laundry, and the Jewish people trading and other kinds of businesses itself, okay? Another thing that we have something in common is that we're all very hardworking, particularly overseas Chinese. You know the notion of 24-7? That means you work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I think that term was actually invented by Chinese and Jewish people. We work very, very hard. The third is that we value education. You see, as I was being introduced, the oldest one, I got my PhD at the age of 66. That was 10 years ago, okay? <laughs> Today in the United States, of the Jewish people, 58%, 58% actually have a college degree, and 28% have an advanced degree. The entire American population only 29% have a college degree, and only 10% have an advanced degree itself. Now, Chinese, we also value education, because this is one way we can move from one social or economic, uh, academic, sorry, economic strata to the next one. And it's also tied into reputation itself. So it's very, very important that we do that. Next, I want to just show you, this is a chart of Chinese entering to the United States. If you look at the early years, 
Very, very few. In fact, if you look at before 1954, uh, there were only a few hundred. The year my father went to University of Michigan, only 375 people were admitted to the United States, partly because they didn't have the funds to do it, but otherwise, actually, Chinese were basically excluded from coming into the United States, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on, okay? But what I want to show you is that today, there are over 300,000 Chinese students in the United States, constitute about one-third of the total Chinese uh, uh, university, foreign university uh, students. And the Chinese students today contribute 9.8 billion U.S. dollars per year to the American economy. So this is uh, something to, to think about. Here's an interesting chart. It talks about billionaires, okay? And uh, shortness of time, I won't go through too much detail, but what you see here is that the percentage of population versus the percentage of billionaires in those respective areas. A similar chart of the Jewish population. 0.2% of the global population, but look at this, the top 50 richest in the world, 24% are Jewish people. So we Chinese, as well as the Jews, we tend to accumulate wealth. Wealth is very, very important to us, okay? So this is one thing. But having said that, we're also very frugal. What's another name for being frugal? Being cheap. We actually know how to spend our money very, very wisely. So this is another commonality. But another common thing is that we are very generous to our own kind and we tend to donate things to support our own community itself. These are two buildings, one in Tel Aviv and one in uh, HKUST, the university I'm affiliated with, all donated by respective uh, uh, people uh, with family names on it. This also gives the people prestige factor, okay? Next, I want to focus on we are also survivors. We like to survive. We have to overcome many, many difficulties, particularly uh, prejudices, okay? So this is the migration pattern from U.S., uh, uh, from uh, uh, into U.S. of Chinese and Jewish people. You can see in the early years, there were very, very few Chinese into the United States. Part of the reason was that in 1880, there was an act called Chinese Exclusion Act. It excluded all Chinese laborers, skilled or unskilled. It was only repealed in uh, the year uh, 1943. Look at these signs. They're very, very discriminatory. So the other thing I want to talk about is a little bit of my own personal experience. I mentioned that my father actually received his uh, master's degree in the United States yet he was unable to find a proper earning job. He had to supplement his income by working in a restaurant in the evenings and on the weekends. This is the only way he can earn enough money to bring us all up. This is very, very common amongst uh, the uh, Chinese itself. The other photo I want to show you is this, okay? This uh, naval officer is me. Okay? May not look like me, but it was me. <laughs> Why I brought this up is that when I was trying to get into the Navy, I was being interviewed. And the interviewer kept saying to me, do you know what it's like to be on an American naval ship? Actually, I didn't know what he was talking about. And he kept on going and going and going. What he really wanted to tell me is that in the U.S. Navy, first of all, there are very, very few Asian naval officers. The second is that if you serve on a ship, the only Asians are Filipinos washing dishes and cooking. Would you want to be that? So I didn't understand that. Anyway, I actually just persisted, and I became a U.S. naval officer, okay? The other thing is that the picture on the right, Nothing special, it's actually my mother and my brother. My brother joined the PLA, People Liberation, as a soldier. 
How many families do you know that one is a U.S. Navy officer and another one is a PLA soldier? <laughs> That's being very, very unusual. <laughs> okay. So we're always Chinese are always being discriminated er elsewhere, and in Malaysia, Indonesia, and so forth. So shortness of time, I better skip. Okay, some of the differences. We Chinese, when we go overseas, we have always this notion of returning. Returning home. In fact, when a Chinese sees another Chinese overseas, the first thing we ask each other is, "Where are you from?" Meaning, what dialect do you speak? And when I come to Shanghai, when people ask me and I speak Shanghai dialect to them, wow, we're friends forever, you know. So this is one of the things. The Jewish people actually don't have the notion of homeland because they've been, they're, they're. You know, political, they seek a political asylum when Chinese traditionally going overseas was for economic reasons. So this is one of the、uh, interesting differences. The other thing is that Jewish people tend to assimilate, particularly in the United States, whereas Chinese, because we're going to go home someday, we do not do that. And let me very, very quickly just to show you some of the accomplishments of Jewish people in the United States. Seven out of the last. Uh, five out of the last Secretary of Treasures are actually Jewish.、S、seven out of the fifteen Federal Reserve Chairmen of、uh, are Jewish. Forty-eight percent of the billionaires in the United States are Jewish. Twenty-three percent of the Nobel Prize winners are actually Jews, also. So, you see how they are accomplished so much accomplishment. So. My concluding remarks. I overran my time a little bit. Okay, today we see people migrating all over the world, particularly in Europe these days. So, the thing they can learn from both us Chinese overseas as well as Jewish diaspora is one: self-reliance. I mentioned that earlier. Hardworking, and value education, education, education. As far as what overseas Chinese can learn from the Jewish people. We need greater unity. Go beyond just the language dialectical bonding. Jewish people bond themselves as a race almost, whereas we tend to bond ourselves dialectically. Assimilation, very very important. Okay, this again is very very important. And the last thing I put down is greater allowance uh, 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 allowance for individualism. We. Because of the Confucianism、uh, philosophy, we the parents tend to guide the next generation as to what to do. So, let the young generation do what they best and what they can achieve. And so, anyhow, I'd like to leave you one additional similarity we both Chinese and Jewish people have is that we both love Chinese food <laughs> for three reasons. One is it tastes good. Second is money value for money, meaning it's very cheap. And the third is that the only restaurants that are open on Christmas Day. <laughs> so with that thought, I thank you all, and it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you.